Um, hello everyone, I hope you're all well. My name is Grant Gibson, I'm a writer and uh, I host a podcast called Material Matters. It's my complete pleasure to chat to the designer, educator and Manchester Met graduate Tim Parsons. Um, I met Tim 20 years ago when I was editing a now defunct, very sadly, magazine called Blueprint and he was at the Royal College of Art. Uh, since then, he's co-founded the Chicago-based design practice Parsons and Charlesworth, uh, as well as being appointed chair, and I've got to get this right because it's quite long, chair of the Design Objects Programme in the Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture and Design Objects at the School of Art, at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. That is a mouthful, but I hope I got it right. Um, he's also yeah. happens, oh good, he also happens to be one of the author of one of the best books on design that I've read in the past 20 years called uh, Thinking Objects, Contemporary Approaches to Product Design. We're going to be talking about his career, uh, as well as the current state of the design world, I guess. Thanks for having me, Grant. Appreciate yes. it. It's a pleasure. Um, I suppose we have to talk about uh, the virus. It's the reason we're doing this over Zoom. Um, how are you coping in Chicago? Uh, pretty well, yeah. We've been in lockdown since about mid-March and uh, the school, obviously, where I'm teaching moved online um, and uh, businesses were closed and, and obviously, like Manchester Met, uh, you know, our degree show was cancelled and um, at first it was a little uh, tricky to, to understand exactly how it was going to affect uh, both the, the teaching and uh, our design practice. And uh, uh, when the lockdown was announced, uh, um, my wife Jess and I got a, a hire car and went to our studio and sort of packed as much stuff as we could <laughs> and brought it home because we, we didn't know if we were gonna be able to go out uh, and use the studio. But um, as it turned out, people were allowed to go to their places of business as long as they weren't places that were sort of open to the public. So. Um, from the design work side, we've been able to, to continue and obviously the, from the school side, there's been an awful lot of work uh, trying to make sure that uh, things can continue in as normal a way as possible under mm. the circumstances. What are the challenges of teaching in this environment? Well, I think the main issues uh, that we found uh, obviously are that it's very difficult to build a sense of community uh, in, over sort of web and using these kind of digital tools and of course you know like uh, Manchester Met uh, there are so many design courses that are about making and so uh, you know the, the, the students have uh, not been able to use the workshops and uh, everyone has different kinds of um, access to equipment at home so uh, I think that it's been a real challenge to try to continue with courses that really were centered around making things. Mm, mm. I mean, can we talk about your time at Manchester Met, memories of being of a student there? Absolutely. What was it like? Yeah. Well, and what, were you a good student? I'm presuming you were. Oh, well, I, I wasn't a student there, I was uh, teaching there. So ah, okay. Manchester Met was my first sort of long-term design teaching job. And I, I moved there in 2002, and uh, I was there for about five and a half years. And um, it was great. I mean, I came there straight from the RCA, from being on the design products course. And um, at, at that time, there were enough other, uh, well, I was one of nine full-time teachers on the 3D design course, uh, most of whom had vast experience, had been there a long time. and. But it was a very interesting course because it had really come about from the, the combination of uh, a very long running craft course and an industrial design course. So students would go through um, training in uh, wood, metal, ceramics, glass, and, uh, and then they would do industrial design as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, I came along and thought, wow, this is incredible facilities here, you know. Um, what an amazing place um, and but you know I learned an awful lot from from uh, my colleagues there and, and uh, uh, I think what, what I've noticed in particular was that because the students managed to gain so many making skills they could immediately go out there and either work for someone uh, as a maker 
Um, so for example, uh, some of the students would go and work for um, McKinnon and Saunders, who were the animators who yep. made Bob the Builder. Um, so they could immediately you know, go and use those kind of uh, mold making skills or like jewelry skills in that kind of job. Or they could set up on their own and, and they would quite, you know, there would be work that came out of the degree shows that, that was just kind of ready to go and um, students would set up. So I met a lot of people in Manchester who had done that. They, they had their own studios from quite a young age. And there was a really nice little scene of, of sort of designer makers. Uh, mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk a bit about your background, Tim? When did you decide you wanted to be a designer? Was design always going to be part of your trajectory? Yeah, I think from a fairly young age. So I, um, most of my sort of youth was uh, in the town in Wiltshire. And um, I just went to uh, you know, the, the comprehensive school there. And we had, I remember when, when I was about sort of 12 or 13, having this class called uh, um, Graphic and Technical Communication. And it was both engineering drawing and a bit of graphic design and uh, really fell in love with the graphic design element of it. And I thought, right, that's, that's it. That's what I want to do. Um, and then, so I, I, I tried to just take the most direct route. So I didn't even do A-levels. I went to a vocational oh, yeah. tech course, hmm. um, which was a sort of general design course, from, which included graphic design. But while I was on that course, I discovered product design. and and found that I was much more interested in the idea of objects that might live on uh, and, and uh, endure in a way that some of the things that I'd been designing um, as pieces of graphic design, such as flyers, uh, wouldn't live on. Um, so again, I was like, right, what's the direct route to that? <laughs> so you know, I did another <laughs> B-Tech course. And uh, I sort of went through this, this sort of series of realizations that every time I did one of these courses, there was a lot more to learn and that I really should uh, you know, go to university. So I ended up at uh, uh, University of Teesside on industrial design uh, BA course, which was really good course. It, had, it was very industry oriented though. It's very much about um, kind of working for uh, either a large corporation or uh, a design consultancy. And I had quite a sort of transformative experience at the end of that course because I'd entered the RSA Design Awards mm -hmm. and I managed to win a travel prize which enabled me to go to America. So this is when I was about 22 and uh, so 1997 and um, I thought this is my big chance you know I'm going to go to all these consultancies and, and uh, get my dream job. And uh, I went around about 11 different consultancies, so places like um, IDEO, and Pentagram, Frog, um, both on the, the East and the West Coast. And um, yeah, to my surprise, you know, a lot of the people I met were not quite as excited about working in that realm as I was expecting them to be. Mm. Uh, they, they sort of really, I got the, the, the sense that um, despite the, um, the kind of glitz of it all, they didn't really have um, as much freedom to change the products that they were working on as, as I thought they would have. So essentially they were doing a lot of styling and it was interesting styling, but uh, it was sort of styling nonetheless. Um, and so I came back a bit sort of crestfallen, but then I started to see work like um, the sort of Droog design, Spirit of the 90s, that kind of uh, the work in that book. and. Um, and then um, work from people like Jasper Morrison and Michael Marriott. Mm. And this work seemed to have uh, a kind of emotional quality to it that some of the commercial work that these consultancies were doing uh, didn't seem to have. And, and it, had a, it had a basis, certainly Droog and, and up to a point Michael's work, a basis in craft, or at least importance of making. Absolutely, mm. yeah. And I think that really came across. And I think I also fell in love with uh, the ready-made around that time as well, you know, the, this idea of taking something um, that already had some kind of cultural meaning um, and using it in a new way. So, you know, um, the product that I always cite is um, Van der Yacht's uh, doorbell that's made of the, the two wine glasses uh, upside down with a little uh, um, hammer between the two. And, uh, you know, this idea that actually the, the object itself 
contains components that are inherently uh, uh, about uh, guests coming around and you drinking some wine, and, uh, and yet it also functions perfectly well as a, as a doorbell. So, you know, I, I started seeing these kinds of products and, and thought, oh goodness, you know, my portfolio is <laughs> uh, completely different from this, and it's nothing I'm interested in doing. So that's really what what led me back uh, to study at the RCA. And when you got to the RCA, what did you discover? Was it in good well, name? Because was, was Ron Arad must have been there not very long, I'm guessing, at that point? Yes. So uh, I got there in 1998, and he had been in charge of the furniture course, I think, mm. for a few years. And um, But just over the summer, um, between me applying and me arriving, uh, the industrial design and furniture course is behind into what was eventually named um, design products and um, I was I feel incredibly fortunate to have come at that time actually because what Ron did was to create this very kind of um, theoretically diverse course in other words the, uh, you know, there were about uh, seven different groups that they call platforms each was headed by two uh, teaching staff uh, who had um, uh, a particular focus. But when you took the range uh, of, of these groups uh, together, it really, you know, it blew my mind as a designer. It was, well, it was, it was an art school within an art school, fundamentally, wasn't it? It was, it, was like yeah. a, it was like a mini art school that he created. I think, yeah, you could say that, certainly. But even within those groups, though, there were some quite commercially oriented groups. Mm. So, yeah, you could certainly um, kind of take a, a platform that, that was a sort of design meets art uh, platform. I mean, Daniel Chani and uh, Gambi Plasma used to run uh, one sort of in that vein. Um, uh, but then you also had, uh, you know, Tony Dunn uh, and Daryl Bishop, uh, who were doing a kind of critical interaction design yeah. based platform. Um, and then, you know, the one I ended up in my first year was uh, Sebastian Byrne and Konstantin Gritchik, who were, were doing a kind of poetic but practical sort of domestic products uh, platform. Um, so, you know, to have all of that and more, you know, in, in a program where I think the other thing that was important about that is that each group had first years and second years in it. So you got to work as a first year with uh, your peers who were, were already more advanced. And uh, yeah, it was just a really great uh, um, kind of melting pot and, and, and a, a way of uh, learning so much about design, not just from your teachers, but, mm. but from, uh, from the, your fellow students. And yeah. so how did it develop your work, Tim? You know, what, what was your work? I mean, you kind of described your work as being quite commercial when you arrived. What kind of things were you designing by the time you graduated? Yeah, so um, I was definitely, you know, influenced by uh, the Italians uh, who were the, the, the kind of heroes of my professors. So people like Castiglione and Enzo Mari. So I definitely continued that vein of, of sort of borrowing things, you know, that I'd been inspired by. So I would look for um, reference points uh, within existing objects and uh, but create a new product and um, my degree show, there were two main things that I designed. One was this thing called half pint mug, uh, which is a ceramic uh, mug that has the, the outer profile of a, a typical beer glass, um, or a pint mug with the, the bump, it's called a nonic glass, but it, it was double walled. So it, it had a bit of a thermos like quality to it. Um, and uh, I prototyped that at the RCA and then I was able to find a, a producer and I could order batches of these. Um, so once I graduated, that was actually what I started doing. I started right. contacting stores and, and uh, sort of selling them directly, essentially. Um, and, um, but the other thing I designed was a set of domestic products based on the music stand. Uh, so my brother had this fold up metal music stand that was really compact and I thought, wow, what an amazing thing. And I, I guess as a student, you know, living in 
small spaces and moving around and just thought, well, wouldn't it be great if all of our furniture could just fold up that small? It's a classic student project, that, isn't it? Because I always think <laughs> students, uh, and bear in mind, this is going to be watched by a lot of students, I suppose, but you see it every year at New Designs, they tend to design for students because that's what they know and that's the life that they're living. So inevitably, they see problems and how to solve their particular issues. But anyway, sorry, I, I'm digressing. Tell us about your music stand. No, oh, it's true. I mean, I think you're, you quite rightly point out it was, uh, um, yes, coming from my own uh, direct experience. But I think I, I tried to set myself quite specific parameters for it, though. So, uh, you know, I think what I found in my undergrad work is, uh, you know, the, the things I was designing were just so far out of my own reach in terms of making them. Uh, so uh, I wanted to do something where I could literally go into the workshops at the RCA and produce the finished thing, uh, albeit with a few components that I bought uh, along the way. And um, so I wanted to make something that both it, it was convincing as a, a finished product, um, but that it had these reference points that, that people would uh, connect with in some way. Um, and so, and that, yeah, when I came out of the RCA, I was like, that was my philosophy, that was my thing, you know, and I was uh, determined to kind of um, stick to that. I think, it's, you know, this is maybe something that, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that relates to I think all students. When they finish a course, they're, they're like, right, you know, uh, how do I describe what I do as being completely unique? And, and uh, how do I kind of essentially sell that. So I, I did feel a sort of pressure to have a kind of coherent philosophy. Um, but looking back now from a, a distance of time, I just think I, I sort of put too much pressure on myself uh, in a way because really you sort of end up pigeonholing yourself a mm. bit um, at a time when really, you know, it's still, uh, you still have lots of options for experimenting and experiencing different things. But on, on the other hand, at least, you know, it's like having a deadline, isn't it? You, you do something, you, you have to you force yourself to get something out at that point. And yeah, you, you might do something else in the future. But um, uh, yeah, I was perhaps a little sick when I look back at, at like me saying, this is what design should be about and, and here's my version of it. Well, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by that because I, I'm, I'm interested to know what kind of your generation what your ambitions were when you were leaving the Royal College certainly when I started writing about design I always had the sense that basically what most people want at that point you know 25 years ago would be to be picked up by one of the big Italian furniture manufacturers probably make something out of roto, roto molded plastic and uh, and you know wear a good suit in Milan was, was was that the kind of you know was that still a thing when you were leaving or because it seems to vanish now. Yeah. I mean, this notion of working for a big furniture manufacturer, it seems to have just died a death, uh, as far as I can see. But maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I think there was still a, a bit of that, but I think we were more realistic. Uh, I suppose, you know, looking, you know, when you're a student in that situation, you sort of look to the, the people who graduated a year or two ahead of you and, and sort of what are they doing? And we didn't really see any of them working in, the, in that context. Some of our teachers definitely were doing that. So um, in my second year, I was with Jasper Morrison and, uh, and Michael Marriott. And um, yeah, at that point, uh, Jasper was working with Magis. And, um, there, but I, think, I don't think we had any particular illusions. I mean, I think that uh, you know, even, even um, I think at that time, uh, there weren't that many uh, recent graduates who were having things produced in the UK either. Mm, mm. I think um, that, uh, I mean, Sheridan had obviously worked with that uh, older generation and um, those, uh, that was still around as a sort of ambition. So we uh, should say that Sheridan Coakley from SCP, sorry, yeah. just in case. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, he, you know, Sheridan uh, Coakley, SCP was the first, place to, to stock my half pint mug so yeah. uh, that was uh, that was my that was as close as I got for uh, to um, uh, actually working with them um, but um, yeah I, I think that that possibly really is what kind of pushed uh, my colleagues towards kind of self-production really I think we we thought well you know uh, it, it seems pretty difficult to 
to get in there. We didn't know exactly how to um, to make these sorts of uh, relationships with Italian companies that uh, we'd read so much about and heard so much about from our teachers. But uh, um, you know, I think uh, we we just tried to uh, to get things out there. So you know, I did the designers block show in London uh, in the uh, several times in the early two thousands and. Um, yeah, and that was, it was a great way of, uh, of, of meeting people from the press. Uh, I got a, a, a teaching job through that. In fact, the Manchester job, uh, I, I met a couple of colleagues from, from Manchester when I was uh, um, at one of the designers block shows. Um, so yeah, I think it, there was um, enough going on in London at that time that if you had something interesting to show, you could probably find an outlet for it or you could find some other opportunities. I mean, um, you've kind of, you've kind of uh, answered my next question, but I think it was, it's a route we should pursue anyway, which is this um, step into academia. Was this always an ambition? What, when, you know, how did that kind of start? Um, well, I think that I, it's really, I noticed uh, when I was at the RCA that obviously these people who I respected enormously, uh, obviously liked teaching and got something from it and I, I didn't think it was just about money um, I think they really enjoyed the conversations that they were having with students and it actually you know meant that they would be enriched by it um, and you know I, I think I realized that the experience I'd had on design products was so different to my undergrad experience that I felt even though I was very young, I sort of felt justified uh, uh, to, to say, well, I could teach, hmm. actually, because I, I could certainly go and teach on an undergraduate program um, because I've got this wealth of, of new knowledge uh, to try to share. Um, and around about that time, I also started writing. Uh, so uh, obviously, yes, when you were editing blueprints, uh, um, I think I wrote a letter about the, um, the satellite fair in the Milan uh, um, furniture fair, and I think I think you said, "Oh, we've already got a letter about that, but can you sort of turn it into an article?" And that was that was literally my first break. That's really interesting because I, I don't remember getting many letters at all doing blueprint. It's, it's one of the great things about magazines. Nobody really ever writes them. If you get a letter, it's like happy day. It has you know the whole thing with social media now. It's it's quite interesting from my perspective doing this podcast and I'm on Instagram with a few followers and um, your relationship with people is very, very different than when you make a magazine where you, you really just putting this stuff out there and yeah, you get stuff back when you met people at shows or graduate shows or whatever, but you didn't get letters. You didn't have this to and fro that you, you get now. Anyway, so I digress because I'm, I'm keen to know um, how teaching has impacted on your, your practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, it's definitely allowed me to explore some of the, the different areas of design which I wasn't really involved in as much uh, either at my undergraduate or, or the RCA. Um, so I think that, that um, the, the sort of necessity to uh, talk about design in a very broad way to students to make sure that you're not kind of really pushing them you know, intentionally or not in one direction, you know, towards a particular type of design. You know, I felt this responsibility to, to try and be as broad uh, as possible. And I think what that then has done for me is to, to make me you know, find interest in, in some of these different areas. So um, certainly my, practice and, and um, certainly in the past few years uh, working at Jess, you know, it's, it's gone in this direction of um, exhibition work that is you know, speculating um, on uh, different subjects and uh, it's, it's really, uh, um, it's a type of design that's quite different from what I was doing before, which was trying to yeah. create consumer products really. Yeah I was going to ask you about that because yeah when we first met obviously you talked about the, the pint pot and um, I remember pewter bowls you were you were doing right. um, and they were definitely products for a market albeit quite a specific niche market. 
Whereas it seems to me the work you and Jess, who is your partner wife, doing yeah. now, um, is is very very different and much more experimental and more about illustrating uh, issues or problems that we face as a society. Was that was that a deliberate? Um, shift? Did you deliberately sit down the pair of you one day and say we're going to stop making this kind of work and we're going to concentrate on doing something else instead? Uh, no, it was a lot more gradual uh, than that actually. Uh, I mean we had been together for seven years before we came to Chicago um, and we had completely separate uh, um, careers uh, so Jess was working in design research and I was teaching at Camberwell and then you know, we both had our own sort of side projects and, and uh, independent work um, that we were doing and um, so Jess came through the design interactions program um, at the RCA and was taught by uh, Tony Dunn of the NRAB uh, among others and um, so she was still very interested in pursuing uh, that kind of work and um, and then yeah when we came to Chicago, it's really, we had a, a sort of peculiar set of circumstances where uh, the visas that we were on put certain restrictions on what we were able to do. So as a teacher on a, this uh, work visa, I wasn't allowed to go out and uh, get lots of clients like I normally would have tried to do um, because I was supposed to be only paid by the school. And then Jess was on a kind of a spouse visa where she wasn't supposed to work at all. Mm. Um, and it took longer than we expected to actually kind of resolve that and, uh, and get green cards. Um, so we had this sort of strange kind of limbo period where um, really we're, you know, the only thing we could essentially do was to, um, to work together um, or to, um, to work on kind of speculative projects. Um, but, you know, during that time, we, we didn't immediately decide to work together. We, we, we got projects that were uh, sort of aimed at one of us and then the other would just kind of help out. And, um, and yeah, over time, I think we just realized, you know, we're quite good at working together. We, you know, we don't argue that much, you know. We, <laughs> Which is handy. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And, um, and we were actually interested in what each other are doing. So, um, you know, after a while, when we got um, a project, we were like, right, let's just do this 50-50 right from the beginning. And, um, and some of those things, you know, they, they, they weren't immediately um, speculative projects. You know, we made some things that were um, sort of designed to be additions or um, short run things. Um, and um, I think still, even now, even though you know, the last few major projects that we've done have been uh, sort of in this realm of uh, um, design for exhibition and, and uh, um, kind of speculative work, uh, it, we're, we're not averse to the idea of, of making objects for production. I, mm. I think the way we describe it really is, is that I think you know, an idea can it, it, you can figure out what the appropriate uh, platform for that idea is and um, it just so happens that some of the things we've been working on the appropriate platform that we've seen is exhibition make a fictional object put it in a show so that it really prompts uh, a response from an audience so let's talk about what you've done tim what what yeah. kind of things have you produced to to what kind of briefs as well Sure, sure, yeah. So, um, I mean, we, the, one of the first projects that we really worked closely together on uh, was for the Istanbul Design Biennial in 2014. And um, we um, were invited to participate in that, but like a lot of Biennales, it had a very kind of broad theme. Um, uh, which was the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> that was the title of it. And um, Zoe Ryan was the curator of it. And, and so as a participant, you had to address that particular theme. Um, and uh, we ended up uh, thinking about um, uh, sort of personal survival and uh, you know, the, the survival kit 
was a, a sort of useful thought experiment about the future to us. So Which has some resonance now, right? I mean, I was <laughs> looking at it on, online. It's like, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> That's right, yeah. It's a sort of that thought experiment of what would you gather together you know, if you were in uh, a disaster situation? Um, what would you want close to you? What would you try to take with you if you had to leave? Um, so that's uh, it, it does and um, people sometimes ask if we've got our own survival kit and <laughs> we actually don't <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah I think that so we created six different survival kits for six fictional protagonists and we're uh, we were particularly interested in trying to uh, steer the conversation around survival away from individualism uh, particularly I think coming to the states the, the culture of preppers and uh, um, obviously the gun culture as well you know there's there's this sort of notion that when uh, you know, disasters happen you uh, you grab your uh, bug out bag <laughs> with your medical supplies and some food and probably a gun and and you head for the hills or you head into your bunker yeah I was going to disappear into a shelter yeah 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 which is a very uh, kind of antisocial <laughs> response in a way um, <laughs> So uh, we, you know, we, we sort of wanted to create these protagonists who had a to totally different uh, sets of desires and needs, and um, so um, that was that was one um, response. So we, we really that there are sort of sets of of objects. Some of the things we've designed specifically, and some of them are uh, existing objects that mm. are into these kits. So we we displayed those. Um, and yeah, I think as is often the case, you know, when you do a certain type of work, you then sort of get offers to do similar kinds of things. Um, and um, so, yeah, we've, uh, the most recent thing we've worked on um, is called Catalog for the Post-Human. And uh, it's a project about uh, human enhancement and the future of work. So it's, it's really looking at the idea of, of uh, um, the sort of accelerated technological culture that we're in now where you know, we have things like uh, um, sort of these algorithm-led corporations uh, um, like Uber or, or Amazon where the, the, the um, lives of individual workers are really largely being determined by uh, the, the demand or the, the digital kind of um, algorithms that, that, that manage the, the information in a company. So, it's, it's, it's looking at some of the more sort of dystopian sides of, uh, of working life, really, and, and sort of asking, well, you know, what sort of uh, things would uh, um, gig economy workers um, be expected to do uh, in, in, in the future uh, if they're expected to kind of stay competitive uh, in this kind of culture? So it's definitely meant to be a satire and it's meant to uh, to be a bit of a kind of cautionary mm. tale, but um, the last iteration of it, we created this vending machine, which has six objects in it and a, a digital interface, and you can go and find out what these objects are by interacting with it. Um, so that was a piece we made for the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, for a show that opened in October, and um, we were going to be launching the next sort of iteration of this. Um, in May at the Venice Architecture Biennale, but uh, that's now been postponed until next May. So we're okay. still working. Yeah. So who, would that have been in the pavilion or in the Arsenale or where, where would that have been? It's in the Arsenale. So right. um, yes, they're putting together <laughs> a group show, uh, which now somewhat ironically is titled, How Will We Live Together? <laughs> 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 yeah, with some difficulty, seemingly. Um, I mean, can we, can we talk about the difference between teaching in the UK and teaching in well, where you are now in Chicago? Um, are the aspirations of the students different? Is the way that you teach different? What, what are the cultural cultural differences? Yeah, uh, I think um, I mean, one of the big differences that I you know, I noticed straight away um, is that uh, the the cost of the edu of education um, uh, in many colleges in the U.S. Uh, is much much higher than the U.K. And what that does is to put a certain amount of pressure uh, on students. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that students in the U.K. don't feel this. I'm sure they do. Um, but there's this pressure to both um, make sure that you're 
coming out with kind of monetizable skills, but also the pressure to go into work uh, straight away, mm. uh, which you know, I feel very fortunate that um, uh, I didn't have as much pressure uh, when I left uh, school, you know, and, and there was also seemed to be um, you know, quite a lot of support systems in the UK uh, things like the Crafts Council, for example, or various other grants that, that you could apply to. Um, so, yeah, when I moved to Chicago with Jess and we were, you know, trying to understand what the design scene was like here, uh, we found very few people working as sort of independent practitioners straight out of graduate school. And it's, it's partly the cost of education. It's also um, the healthcare situation. If you're running your own business, uh, you have to pay for your own um, health insurance, um, which is not cheap if you want to have a decent policy. Um, so, you know, there's all these little factors that, that, that um, really um, influence people. And um, so I find that you know, a lot of graduates, they would, um, from the US, they want to, to find a job pretty quickly. So they'll either try and go into consultancy or work in-house. Uh, for a large company. Um, so that seems to be the aspirations, whereas certainly when I left, uh, I, I can't speak for, for um, how the situation is in the UK now, but yeah, when, when I left, um, everyone wanted to, to do their own thing, yeah. and, um, or at least just survive uh, independently. And uh, I, I think it was a lot easier, it seems, uh, to do that um, at, at that point. Yeah. I mean, can we talk about uh, writing? Mm. You, you did this book, uh, Thinking Objects, Contemporary Approaches to Product Design, yeah. uh, which, you know, I, 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 I thought was an excellent piece of work. I still do. I, I haven't read a better book about product design uh, since. Um, I guess, but I'm interested. I mean, why did you decide to do that? And, and how has that affected your practice? Um, well, I think... I really enjoyed writing and, and, and still do. I, and I think, I guess it, it, for me, it was just an, an extension of uh, writing articles and um, just, I think when, when I uh, left the RCA, I, I, I sort of had this notion that I would try and split my time three ways. I, I wanted to be an independent designer, I wanted to teach and I wanted to write. and I felt that each one of those things was fed by and fed the other two in a very satisfying way. So, you know, writing, you know, I, I have to say, when I was at school, I was not into writing at all. I, I got a D in English in my GCSEs. <laughs> and um, it wasn't until uh, I went to Teesside and I had a very good uh, design history teacher, a uh, chap called Paul Dennison, uh, who would set us these uh, really interesting uh, sort of challenges, really, to, to write papers about things that we, we didn't know about, and, and he would guide us very well. And, and that gave me the bug for, for actually researching and discovering things about design, designers, the design process. And I realized how much um, benefit I got um, out of that. And at the RCA at the time, um, it was compulsory to write a 10,000 word dissertation, <laughs> and, which again, most people hated. And, um, but I, yeah, I ended up finding that really enjoyable. I wrote about ready-mades in design and um, you know, got a lot of great uh, assistance from, from Michael Marriott, but I was also able to interview a lot of people like Ron Arad, like Tord Bunche, who were working in that way. Mm. At, Time. So, you know, it, it was really an opportunity to, to sort of be a journalist but without being trained in, in it. Uh, so um, I think, yeah, once I left and I started teaching for a while, you know, I thought, oh, I'd really love to be able to sort of bring that um, sort of RCA experience of all the breadth of, of um, design, you know, together with uh, this kind of teaching context where you know, again, I, was, I wasn't really finding that many books that, that um, had this kind of breadth. You'd, there, there would be a lot of the, the um, kind of um, 
uh, Tashin books where they, they bring together, you know, a hundred different designers or whatever, or a thousand chairs or whatever. But, you know, there wasn't really something that, that sort of mapped out the territory. And, and so, yeah, it really came out of, uh, of that desire to combine the, the RCA experience with um, the teaching experience and, and provide a book that, that I would have wanted to read yeah. when, I, when I was an undergraduate. I mean, it's a tremendously handy skill if you possess it, being able to write. If you look at, you know, whether it's Le Corbusier or in, in Craft, Edmund Duval really went to another level when he wrote, you know, the huge best-selling book, Hair with the Amber Eyes, is handy if you own half of your family, owned half of Europe, admittedly. But, but Annie Albers uh, and, and various others, it, it, it's a very, very useful tool. And I guess also it feeds into your, as you pointed out, it feeds into your work. I mean, and, and has it become like a a guide for your teaching, I wonder. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, I've used it a lot. Um, and, uh, and just in the last couple of years, uh, I've actually used it as the basis for creating an online design course called Making Meaning, an Introduction to Designing Objects. And because uh, I used to joke that the, uh, the worst thing about that book is that it's a book, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's uh, not always easy to get out there and, and uh, for people to digest it. And I thought well, I'd love it to be a, a sort of a TV series, really. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm not likely to be commissioned anytime soon <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but, uh, but this uh, opportunity came up to do this uh, online design course. And uh, really, it's like making a very low budget <laughs> TV show. You know, you're, uh, you've got a green screen behind you and, uh, uh, and you're kind of talking away and then you can you know, cut away to, to different bits of footage that you've prepared. So, um, yeah, I, I really used it to, to revisit a, a lot of the material from the book. Um, I went out and did some new interviews and um, uh, really tried to get uh, advice for young students you know, from uh, professionals in the field. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun uh, putting it together. And, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm hoping that uh, particularly during this sort of lockdown period, uh, um, things like that might be of, uh, of interest. To of people. use, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're coming, heading towards the end of our time, Tim. I'm looking at my watch, which is next to me on, on this laptop. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe we could finish up with a few reflections. This is going to be watched by, I'm hoping, uh, a lot of uh, people who are just leaving Manchester Met. Where do you think the design industry is at the moment? Wow, well, yeah, I mean, it's a, a tough question to sort of situate it, you know, holistically. Um, uh, I think that with the, the, the pandemic, I think what it, that has done is, is to shed light on the fact that, that uh, um, we're not very well organized for this kind of thing, you know, and that uh, it's... Um, the, the idea of, of um, futures or futuring, I think, has, um, has, has not really been at the forefront uh, of, uh, of designers' minds uh, for many years. And, and suddenly we've, we're thrust into this situation where we don't really know what's going to happen uh, one week to the next. And, uh, and so suddenly the idea of, of people who are engaged in planning uh, engaged in thinking through what the future might look like, um, that has really, um, I think, become um, uh, more valuable. Or people are realizing that, that that's uh, something that designers could be involved in. Um, but um, I think, you know, that's only one aspect of it. I think there's uh, all of the things that, that uh, um, have been going on in design for many, many years uh, are going to continue. So. I think that um, you know, students are um, still going to be able to get out there and, and uh, you know, use their creativity and, and uh, that, the, the need for uh, creativity is really, if anything, is, has got uh, um, stronger and more important uh, because of, of this, this situation. Um, but it seems to me, I think you're absolutely right, it seems to me we're going to have to rethink, unless a vaccine is suddenly found in the next year or so, and then, you know, the chances of that are 50-50, uh, I guess, from what one reads, is that we're going to have to rethink everything, the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we shop, the, you know, 
everything is going to have to be rethought. I mean, there is, it's going to be tough. There's no question with the economy, but it seems to me that ultimately there are probably going to be a lot of opportunities out there to completely reimagine. Because we all thought, for instance, take the workplace. We all thought we kind of knew how the, the best workplace worked now. You know, you had different environments for different tasks, breakout spaces, spaces for intimate meetings, spaces for large meetings, places for people to relax, places for people to concentrate. I mean, that didn't happen very often in many offices because of money, but, but you know, basically we kind of worked out. And, and obviously what's happened in the last four months completely changes the way that we interact with the workplace. Um, so it seems to me that, yeah, it's, it, in some ways it's, it's uh, difficult, but also potentially quite an interesting time to be arriving in the design world. Absolutely, yeah. I think, uh, you, yeah, you can really see it the way that, that uh, businesses who have uh, um, really thought through how they're going to survive, really thought to engage with their customers, uh, they're the ones who are much more likely to survive. Um, and I think also the, the, there's um, the, the kind of, um, uh, I think there's an interesting opportunity uh, in some of the, the kind of softer skills or the, 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 the sort of nuances of, uh, of what we've been forced into, such as the uh, Zoom calls. You know, uh, you know, a lot of people find them extremely difficult and um, you know, because it, it is such a, uh, a different experience to being in a room with people and the, the power dynamics change and um, I think there's uh, a lot of I think interesting work to be done in uh, how do we effectively uh, communicate with each other how do we take all of those things that we, that we took for granted previously and uh, make them really effective uh, in this new world yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about you personally, Tim? Uh, plans for the future? Will you be coming back to the UK or is Chicago now your permanent residence? I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, Chicago has been good to us. Uh, it, it's been a good place to, to live. It's, it's, poss it's possible to uh, afford studio space here. Um, there's, there's uh, you know, an interest in culture. The design culture is is very different. I do miss the London design culture, definitely. It's much more kind of commercially oriented here. Um, but yeah, I would say we're keeping our options open, yeah. Fair enough. Well, that's a nice place to leave it. Tim, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me, Grant.